Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn, Diversify Your Lawn, Converting Your Lawn to Rich Layers of Native Plants. Who says lawns need to be monocultures made only of grasses? We can do better than the default landscape material that covers many of our yards. Anna Fialkoff is the program manager for the Wild Seed Project, and she's here with us today to share how we can transition grass monocultures to meadows or convert to layers of native plants and why it matters. Anna, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Kathleen Neal. I'm the director of policy and partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters, Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 8,500 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today. We will hear from Anna and then tackle questions in the Q&A session at the end. You don't have to wait though, you can send your questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you. I'll keep track of them and ask them during the Q&A at the end. You can message Will Sedlak with any technical difficulties. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns. Thank you all again for joining us. And Anna, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much. I'll share my screen. All right, can everybody see my screen all right and hear me? All yeah. right. Well, I'll get started. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this lunch and learn. Um, I hope that you're all settling in with something warm or a cup of tea on this chilly fall day. Um, in October. I haven't yet turned the heat on in my house yet. <laughs> um, but I'm coming to you from Wild Seed Project in Portland, Maine. And if you don't know very much about Wild Seed Project, we are a nonprofit that is dedicated to educating the public about the value of native plants. And uh, we sell native seeds, um, native plant seeds uh, from our online store. We put out an annual publication. This year it was in the form of a tree guide. So I'll share more about that in the presentation. And we do public presentations like this. To, we just do lots of outreach and education to get people to learn about how they can create wildlife habitat in their own backyards by planting native plants. And part of that involves um, a movement that we've begun last September, uh, not this September, but September 2020 called the Pledge to Rewild or the Rewilding Pledge. And that is uh, basically trying to start a movement to get people to put back native plants into the landscape. It can be in your own backyard. It can be in your community landscape. If you don't have your own land of your own, like, like myself, I actually live in an apartment. Um, I have native containers on my front stoop and I get involved with community projects. Um, it also involves not just what you plant, but how you manage your planting. So things like leaving the leaves for critters to overwinter um, and stopping pesticides and, and spraying uh, fertilizers as well. So, um, and then sharing that everything that you've learned about the Pledge to Rewild with your neighbors and joining forces with each other to kind of spread this message. So that's all about what the Rewilding Pledge is about. Um, so today I want to talk to you about a really important piece of that pledge, and that is diversifying your lawn um, and essentially, you know, converting it or transforming it into rich layers. Uh, layers in the landscape will help increase um, native plant biomass, which increases uh, the amount of wildlife habitat that we can foster. Um, so if possible, converting your lawn to meadows or forest-like um, gardens is a really great idea. And I'll give you some kind of how-tos on how to, how to think about that. So my only negative slide is that the one that I'm going to start with here. I just want to kind of talk about, you know, why it might be an important thing to shrink your lawn 
or reduce your lawn size. Um, lawns really do suck, in my opinion. They suck time, money, and resources. Um, they're the second most irrigated, irrigated crop in the United States. Um, we use fossil fuels, uh, burn fossil fuels when we mow, though there are electric mowers these days. Um, mowing is, you know, something that is, is just um, second nature in our culture. Um, and then we also spray pesticides and herbicides to keep um, the monoculture, monocultures of, of lawn, one uniform Kentucky bluegrass um, field and um, not let any pests or diseases or any other plants kind of work their way in. We also put fertilizers down on our lawns and those actually wash into water bodies with our stormwater runoff, um, creating toxic algal blooms and all sorts of hazards for wildlife and people alike. And last of all, lawns are practically sterile places. It's kind of like having a desert, even though there is the, the lawn itself is living. Um, it's one species or maybe a couple different species. Whereas if you have native plantings in place of lawn, that can create um, a whole ecosystem for wildlife to, to thrive in. Um, so I think that there's a lot that we can do instead of lawns. So let's think about some of those things. I think the first thing is the, the st second step or action step in our pledge to rewild is to shrink your lawn. The first step is to plant native trees, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But shrinking your lawn, even just by half, as Douglas Tallamy recommends, he's the author of Nature's Best Hope and uh, more recently, The Nature of Oaks. Um, and he's pointed to the idea that if if each of us just shrunk our lawns in half even, we don't have to get rid of them all together, that we could make a huge environmental impact and foster wildlife habitat in our own backyards, not just um, thinking about conservation as being out there in conservation areas and wilderness preserves and national parks, but right where we live. So um, ways that you can think about shrinking your lawn are just stopping mowing good portions of your lawn, um, letting some of the vegetation come back and letting that kind of unmown edge frame gathering spaces and outdoor rooms, places for recreation. Lawn is actually you know, functional in some ways. It's an important place for us to um, walk through the landscape. It's a, it's a place that we can walk around and trample. Um, but we can think of it as, you know, the carpet within, uh, or not the carpet, but um, an aerial rug within our outdoor rooms rather than wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Um, I really like that approach of thinking about it and thinking about all the vegetation, the trees, the shrubs, the herbaceous layer, uh, the ground covers as a way to kind of frame those outdoor rooms and pathways. So why mow when you can meadow, right? Um, meadows are one of the more popular kind of um, native habitat types that people are now converting their lawns to because they are shown to be really wonderful pollinator habitats. They're full of flowers, especially if you plant it well, you can have flowers blooming throughout the course of the season. And those flowers are really essential to the bees, the wasps, the flies, the moths, the butterflies, the um, and some of the birds like hummingbirds, beetles, all sorts of pollinators um, that are essential to um, helping keep plants going, um, keeping their populations going, helping them set seed and keep thriving as well as, you know, being an important part of our food system. We need pollinators to pollinate many of our crops. But we can also think about um, our native habitats um, as pollinator habitats, even if they're not necessarily meadows per se. So thinking about the forest systems and um, the other types of habitats that you might have that are not just meadows. Meadows are lovely though. They're a really um, lovely way to get lots of color into your landscape and all those pollinator opportunities. Converting your lawn to meadow or any other type of habitat can be, um, 
easy actually, but there's some different ways that you can do it. One way that I think is a little bit more advanced would be to just stop mowing altogether and kind of see what comes up. That requires a little bit more knowledge about what the plants are that are gonna come up, especially if there are invasive species or weedy plants that you wanna discourage. Um, it's definitely a good idea to remove any invasive species that come up before trying to replant or let um, a lawn kind of transition to native plant habitat because those invasive species have um, these special abilities to reproduce and spread rapidly and kind of take over our native ecosystems. So we really need to manage those first. I'm not going to concentrate on that today because that could be a whole talk in and of itself. Um, but I love this meadow with, um, sorry, with Joe Pye weed in the background. That's the lavender colored flower, the New York ironweed. And then we have a couple of other species uh, that are in yellow and back. We have um, the woodland sunflower and then the sneezeweed, which is not actually an uh, allergy inducing plant. It's just called that. Um, but those are both beautiful yellow flowers that bloom in late summer and autumn. So my favorite way to convert my lawn um, to native plant habitat is to do something called sheet mulching. And some people call it lasagna layering. There's a number of ways that you can do this, but my preferred method is to first um, and it's a really great no dig method. Um, you don't have to put backbreaking labor into converting your lawn. You don't have to dig out that turf grass and figure out what to do with it. You just put down a layer, a nice layer of cardboard. Um, that cardboard really needs to be overlapping so that you don't have any uh, light kind of coming through and hitting the, the ground. And that's really important because this is a smothering method and smothering works by just depriving the plants underneath of light and mainly light is what they need to keep growing. So um, if you provide, you know, if you take away that, then it doesn't take too long to um, to kill grass and other weedy plants in the grass. For something like invasive species, that's a whole nother story. You need to do some more intensive um, work uh, like smothering much longer term or um, pulling them out or you know, making sure you cut them back before they go to seed. Um, so there's other methods that you would employ for um, smothering invasive species. But um, then on top of that, you wanna put down about two to four inches of aged bark mulch or composted leaves. And those are both great um, different types of mulches. I really like using composted leaves in my garden beds year round. Um, and I mainly collect those you know, in the fall and the spring, and then I can put them in a pile and age them in place, let them break down kind of as if they're just composting. And then I can use them on my garden beds to help smother out weeds, to help retain soil moisture, um, and to add organic matter to the soil. So a lot of what this is, is really the cardboard is organic matter, and so are the aged bark mulch and composted leaves. So while you're smothering those plants underneath, the lawn underneath, you're um, also adding a lot of life to your soil. You can let that break down for about three months or more. So if you put this down in the fall, then you can plant into it the following spring. Or if you put it down in, in the early spring, you can plant into it the following fall. And spring and fall are really great times to plant. Now, um, if you want to um, not leave this as just kind of mulch and um, cardboard for the whole growing season, you can um, put in a cover crop of some sort. So there's actually a lovely native plant called partridge pea that's an annual, it's in the pea family as its name indicates. And so it's a nitrogen fixer, which means it can help enrich soils and make them better prepared for um, new plantings. So this is, since it's an annual, it will um, you can, it's one of the, you know, very few native plants that you want to just kind of cast out into the landscape to grow from seed. Others I'd kind of recommend to put in a pot and grow them that way. We have lots of resources on the Wild Seed Project website for growing 
um, native seeds and we recommend putting them in pots, sowing them in pots in the winter and then they germinate in the spring. But this is kind of a different, a different type of plant that it um, is a very fast growing plant because it's an annual. Annuals kind of have their reproductive strategy as plate, putting out tons of seeds into the world and um, they'll come up year after year as long as there's some open soil for their seeds to find. But a perennial will um, have a living root system underground and die back to the ground each year and then re-sprout from that same spot, whereas an annual won't be found in the same spot year after year. Um, the same plant won't be found in the same spot. You might see another plant the following year in the same place, but that's actually a new plant. So um, also partridge pea is a really great kind of pollinator powerhouse. So in the time where you don't have other things going or where you're planning your garden, um, it will come up and bloom in the month of July and have these uh, pollen rich blossoms. And then it has these little extra floral nectaries, they're called, they're little cups of nectar at the base of the petiole, which is that stalk between the leaf that attaches the leaf to the main stalk of the plant. And they're really small, but you can see them with the naked eye. And um, other pollinators that enjoy nectar will be attracted to those. And so you'll get moths and butterflies and all sorts of bees, as well as ants that um, will crawl around the plant. Basically, if you look at any of these plants during the growing season, you'll see ants crawling around and drinking from the extra floral nectaries. And the plants, in, I mean, sorry, the ants in turn protect this plant from herbivory. So it's a great symbiotic relationship. And you can see that this plant really has a whole ecosystem around it. It's buzzing with life, when, especially when it's in bloom. And it's even been used as um, a trap crop for agricultural crops. So that means that it lures over the pests, um, The for, for example, the European corn borers from, if it's planted next to a corn crop, it'll lure those corn borers over and then the beneficial insects that are all around the partridge pea will predate those corn borers. So it's a really lovely plant for so many reasons. And I think it's a great one to use if you're starting out a new meadow and you have bare ground, um, it can help hold the soil and um, shade the ground while slower growing grasses and longer lived perennials get established. And then over a couple years, this plant will actually peter out um, as there's less bare soil for it to seed into. And you'll have your longer lived plants that will take its place. So after you are finished you know, with your native cover crop, you've sheet mulched for that whole growing season or it, that whole winter, you can plant into it in the spring or fall. And um, you can plant a variety of different types of things. Um, at Nasami Farm, which is part of Native Plant Trust, um, uh, the, the organization Native Plant Trust, um, one of their interns named Shannon Dry did a really lovely intern project one year where they converted this parking lot island that was all grass, compacted and hot and dry and exposed and tough, this really tough area, um, into a kind of a long alternative trial bed. So they did sheet mulching, they covered it with composted leaves instead of aged bark mulch, and they planted into it with sedges, which are grass-like plants that often take the place of grass and create really lovely ground covers, foam flower, three um, toothed sink foils, which is a really tough native plant for parking lot islands, um, wavy hair grass, a whole host of really lovely native plants. Wild strawberry is another one. And um, it ended up being kind of a patchwork of of um, native lawn alternatives that eventually knit together. The shadier plants did really well under that pin oak in the background. And then um, the plants at the edges were the ones that could tolerate the most harsh environments. So here's an example of what one of those native kind of ground covers or lawn alternatives look like. Um, if it's planted on mass, it can become kind of a lawn alternative. It's uh, Pennsylvania sedge. It's actually, it looks a lot like lawn and you could mow it maybe once or twice a year if you wanted to give it a nice clean look, but it actually doesn't need to be mown at all because it won't grow over about six to eight inches in height, barely that if anything. 
Um, it also is very drought tolerant, so it doesn't require inputs of extra water once it's established. Um, and it does really well in the shade. It doesn't take the same foot traffic that a lot of lawn does take. It could probably take a little bit, but you couldn't play soccer on it frequently. But if you want a lawn like look, this is a nice um, alternative. It also is a pollinator plant. And I have a picture of these wind pollinated flowers that come up in early spring. Now, even though its flowers are not pollinated by animals, it's wind pollinated, it's still a pollinator plant because the leaves are actually attract um, butterfly, and uh, butterfly and moth caterpillars, which actually feed on the leaves. Um, and so it feeds pollinators in an early stage in their life cycle, which is something that a lot of native plants do. So you can have um, life in your lawn without um, necessarily with having a lawn like look, but without necessarily having to plant something that doesn't look like lawn. And another, you know, lawn alternative that is edible too is the wild strawberry. You can plant both Pennsylvania sedge or wild strawberry into a lawn that's existing, or you could plant them as uh, their own ground covers, um, and they can both be mowed. Uh, wild strawberry can be mowed even more frequently, but um, I like to not mow it so that I can make sure it flowers and supports pollinators in that way. Its foliage supports pollinators as well. It's also a larval host to moth and butterfly caterpillars, and it provides those yummy strawberries that I grew up um, wandering around in my backyard. I was very lucky to have a backyard that had wild strawberries in them and eating. And I always thought they were tastier than the cultivated strawberries, which can be kind of watery. These are nice and sweet. And it's kind of an extra special treat when you can pick a whole handful um, that fits in your hand. Another ground cover that I really like that could be kind of a um, an alternative to lawn, or it could be just a ground cover in and of itself, is something very versatile. It's called running ground cell. And there's a number of different species of ground cell, but I love this one the most, the Pacara obovata. It has um, cheery yellow blooms in spring, blooms at the same time as wild columbine, as you can see here, and they look lovely together. But uh, what's not shown in this picture is that it has very nice kind of ground hugging foliage that um, is a true ground cover. Um, it knits together um, and colonizes an area, but it's not overly aggressive. It'll play well, especially underneath the feet of taller legier perennials like New England asters and Joe pie weeds and New York iron weeds or underneath um, kind of taller trees or shrubs as well. And then I actually, you know, I think that, well, um, it's a good idea to think about alternatives to our traditional lawn and planting ground covers. I think we need to think about all the other layers that we can put in our landscape as well, because um, as you can see with this landscape, it's really stacked, packed, and layered together. You have as many native plant species as possible in here, as well as all the you know ground covers, the knee-high perennials, um, you have various shrubs, even if they're in containers because it's a small space, you have vines and some small trees. So in this backyard, it's um, not, it's an urban area. It's, it doesn't have a lot of room for large trees necessarily, but you do have um, still quite a bit of biodiversity in here. And this is a lovely fall scene uh, that I, I find to be really beautiful. Native plants can be ornamental. Um, they don't have to just look like kind of messy um, uh, meadows necessarily. So one of the native trees that I like, I, I'm going to go through some of the layers that you can put in your landscape. So one of my favorite native trees to use is beech plum. And I'd consider that either a small native tree or it could be a shrub depending on how you take care of it over time. You can let it have multiple stems and be more shrubby. Um, naturally, in its natural habitat, it grows in sand dunes and um, along the coast. And so it can handle um, salt as well as very dry, well-drained soils. So it works really well for urban environments as kind of an urban street tree. You can see that it's planted here in just kind of a two foot wide bed right next to a driveway. So um, it's, uh, it's on a, you know, a self, 
facing side of a house and it gets a lot of heat and sun during the growing season. Um, another thing that's awesome about it is that it flowers, beautiful flowers that look like plum and cherries in the spring, and then it produces cherry sized fruits um, that are true plums. Um, so they taste just like a cultivated plum, maybe even a little sweeter in my opinion. Um, and they're just lovely, lovely plants. They support wildlife um, and, you know, with their fruits and flowers. And um, it's just, you know, something that I could see putting in any urban um, garden. Now, you could plant so many native trees that would kind of foster a huge amount of wildlife. And many native trees are considered what Doug Tallamy calls keystone plants or keystone species. Those are plants that support um, the most wildlife. And um, if you just plant those, that's already a really great start in, in creating some wildlife infrastructure in your garden. So those are things like oaks, cherries or plums. So the beach plum fits in that category willows, birches, and poplars. And these could be trees, some of them are shrubs, but anything in these um, genres. So um, oaks in and of themselves support um, in some areas like in um, Delaware where Doug Tallamy uh, lives and when works, they support 500 plus species of moth and butterfly caterpillars which feed on their leaves. Um, in Maine, it's closer to 400, but it's still a huge number. And we can plant vines to fill up some of that vertical space. Um, Virginia creeper is a vine that grows nicely up a tree. So you can provide even more wildlife habitat by having a large oak tree on your property that you preserve. Um, it'll increase the property value and then have a Virginia creeper climbing up it. And um, that is you know, a plant that actually supports the um, the Pandora Sphinx moth, with it, which is a really beautiful and interesting looking moth. The trumpet honeysuckle in this picture is one of my favorite vines as more of a gardeny kind of vine because it stays in its clump. It doesn't kind of get as wild as some of the others um, and it blooms for a really long time. It's a pollinator magnet, including hummingbirds. So uh, this is a vine, when I worked at Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Massachusetts as a horticulturist, we had this vine growing outside of our horticulture building in the entrance. And um, I would frequently see hummingbirds visiting it. I also, uh, I think there was a robin's nest inside this nice um, dense shrub. So any, or sorry, dense vine. So anytime you can have dense vegetation, it could be evergreen, um, it could be trees or shrubs or vines, you'll have opportunities for birds to find cover and forage and um, to find food to eat because they rely on uh, a diet of insects primarily, as well as fruits and berries of native plants. Um, thinking about shrubs, that shrub layer that's a little lower down, um, I think shrubs, you know, we, we can do so much better than the lilacs that we have in many of our landscapes. Um, sweet pepper bush is a really lovely example. It's fragrant, as fragrant as lilacs, if not more, because you can smell them from afar, especially if you're biking through, say, a wetland in the middle of the summer. You'll often smell sweet pepper bush um, all around you. It's gorgeous. And then it's a very great pollinator magnet as well. Um, it creates kind of a nice informal hedge and same with some of these other shrubs that I have listed here. Uh, bayberry is fragrant too, its leaves are fragrant, spicebush as well is fragrant and is the host plant for the spicebush swallowtail butterfly. And then coming down to the perennial layer again, thinking about what's growing on the ground, if we can put an aster, at least an aster and a goldenrod in every garden, every garden can accommodate one. And there is an aster and a goldenrod for every situation. So um, there's no excuse to not have them. They're also considered keystone plants because they support hundreds of species of moth and butterfly caterpillars. And they're essential late, for, uh, late season forage of pollen and nectar for bees and wasps. So 
we can plant more and more um, of these beautiful asters and goldenrods. Sometimes they get a reputation for being some more, you know, slightly more weedy plants, but I think it can be a lot about the species that you choose and the way that you put them in your garden. So for example, um, goldenrod is, um, has a reputation which is false for causing allergies and being kind of an agricultural weed. It actually doesn't cause allergies. It's um, animal pollinated. So it's pollen is sticky and heavy and likes to stick to the legs of bees and bodies of bees. Um, whereas one plant that blooms at the same time as goldenrod called ragweed is responsible for many um, of the fall allergies that people experience. So as well as grasses, which are wind pollinated too. So um, that actually, I wanna debunk that myth um, that goldenrods cause allergies. There's also flax leaf stiff aster is a really lovely kind of, it could be a ground cover, but it's a nice short, stout, upright plant um, that blooms prolifically and actually has really lovely fall color. Um, then we have blue wood aster billows. Right now it's billowing with um, little tiny flowers, very floriferous. Zigzag goldenrod thrives in a little bit of shade with moisture. Um, and then the reef goldenrod, or sometimes called blue stem goldenrod, has these flowers that bloom in the axils between the leaf and the stem, and they bloom all up and down the stem, making it look kind of like a wreath. And it's very ornamental. It gr grows very well in the shade um, and dry shade with a little bit of sun works too. Flax leaf stiff aster is one that you could plant with beach plum because it also grows really well in sand dunes and takes dry, sunny soils. So there's something for everyone here. Um, so that's where I want to end with um, my little presentation. And then I wanna open it up to questions and answers next. Now I'll leave you with a few slides that are are going to be great for you know finding further resources. Um, and I want to encourage everybody to take the pledge to rewild. You can visit the Wild Seed Project website um, and sign up. It's free. And when you take the pledge, you actually um, get emailed lots of, it's kind of like a miniature course that's free. You get emailed resources, tools, and guidance on figuring out how to where to start, how to rewild your lawn in these 10 actionable steps. And then um, you're also put on this map where you can kind of show your collective impact and we can show all the people that have pledged to rewild. So thank you very much. I, I'm excited to answer some of your questions. Further reading. I'm glad you, you're, you're ready for questions, Anna, because we've got a whole bunch of them. <laughs> uh, before we do, we this is uh, the part of our, our Lunch and Learn regulars know that this is the part of the program where we share a call to action. Uh, so I love these suggestions more from the, the blog and from uh, additional resources. Want to let everybody know that we will share a link to the Wild Seed Project website in the follow-up email that goes out later this afternoon, including a link to, to sign up for that Rewild pledge. Uh, I think you're gonna, I, I predict you're gonna have a little bit of a bump after this, uh, this lunch and learn. That's wonderful. So thank you. Uh, let's, let's dig into questions. First one, what does native plant mean? Are we talking about just Maine or is there some larger definition that we should have in, the, have in mind? That's a really good question. And I think that a lot of us get stuck on it. Um, for our purposes, I'd say a native plant is, just to put it a little bit more simply, is a plant that has come to a specific, been in a specific area um, in, the, in North America pre-European colonization, because after that, um, after Europeans kind of got to the U.S. they and the Americas, they we began kind of a worldwide exchange of plants all around and many new plants entered into the scene. Um, of course, Native Americans moved plants around too, um, but we consider a lot of those native because they have been here a very long time, thousands of years for many of them. Um, but you can qualify the word native and, and think about it as you can be native to a region like New England, you can, it can be native to 
the state of Maine um, or just North America in general. Can all, a plant can also be native to maybe say a 10 mile radius, but that depends on who's talking about the plant and what their goals are. So for wild seed project, um, we consider, we have a, um, we're not very strict about our definition of native. I think native to New England is generally what we're talking about when we think of native to Maine. Um, and we're not, we're not strict on plants have to be from the state of Maine because plants move outside of political boundaries. Um, our political boundaries are artificial. Um, and there are many native plants that, that are native, maybe a little farther south in the, in the Appalachian Mountains or in the Midwest that do very well here. So to get into even a little bit more detail, um, the glaciers actually have pushed down and scraped down all the plants out of New England, pushed them farther south. And then, and a lot of the plants that are native farther south were at one point native to New England. So I think many of those plants actually do well in New England, but um, we do have to be you know, mindful of introducing new plants from other regions because they could potentially become invasive and bully out plants that have been here for a long time. So just to give you a little rundown, I hope that's not too complicated. <laughs> I really appreciate it and appreciate that guidance not to overthink it too much. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so where do you recommend, given that there is some, some squishiness to that native native plant definition, where should we be looking to purchase native plants? Obviously, we can get seeds directly from you, but are there, there are nurseries that are really known for, for their native plant collections or, or particular landscapers? How do we know what to, where to get these things? That's another great question, and one that we actually address um, on our website and through our resources. Um, so we actually have this lovely blog post called Navigating the Nurseries. Here, I'll flip the slide so that you can see it. It's at the top here. So if you go to our website and search that, you'll find it. And um, you know, Wild Sea Project was started by Heather McCargo, our founder, in 2014. And, and she went, you know, has lived in Maine for a number of years. She's found that the state of Maine especially has been a little bit behind on um, native plant and ecological resources for landscapers and homeowners, as well as having the native plants themselves um, that are being demanded as the education gets better about native plants. So we're we're now we're we're getting a little bit better, but we're still um, we still don't have the amount of places as say Massachusetts has to buy native plants. But I'd say if you can start supporting those local, small, sometimes family-run nurseries that grow native plants, especially from seed. Um, plants grown from seed have a lot of genetic variability and have the ability to adapt to climate stressors like um, things like flooding and drought and extremes in temperature, um, whereas most nursery plants are cloned. So those are exact replicas of one from the next. Um, and they don't, with each generation, get that genetic variability that will allow them to adapt to, to tough challenges and that are ahead for us. So um, that's just one thing to think about. Another thing to think about when sourcing native plants is to find plants that are grown without pesticides, if possible. Um, and you do sometimes have to ask individual nurseries uh, about that specifically. And if more and more of us are asking for seed grown plants and plants grown without pesticides, it will become more like the organic food movement where the demand will drive that and nurseries will feel forced to start providing that for us. Um, those pesticides can stay in plants for years and years and can and work their way into the food chain by going into pollinators and then the birds and other wildlife that eat those pollinators. And that's a big problem. So I'd say look for Maine native nurseries. We have a really great source uh, or um, sorry, we have a really great um, website um, or web page that's called Where to Buy Native Plants. Uh, it's linked to the Navigating the Nurseries blog and it goes by state. So you can find nurseries that are local to you. Um, sometimes it's not easy to find what you're looking for in your state. So there are some really great reputable places like um, 
native plant trust. That's where I used to work. Uh, Garden in the Woods and the Sami Farm are both um, their properties and they sell native plants that are grown from seed without pesticides there. Um, Prairie Moon Nursery is a great place to get something like partridge pea. Um, that's actually in the Midwest, but it is a really great reputable nursery as well. Um, you can find seeds in bulk there. Um, from Wild Seed Project, we sell um, you know, smaller seed packets. So if you wanted to seed a whole area, you'd really want to get larger amounts of seeds. And they sell bare root plants. I also love Fedco. Um, they have a great native tree sale that you have to um, put in your order over the winter, and then you get bare root trees in spring, and you want to plant those right away. Um, so that's also a really great source for both perennials and trees. So those are just a few, but you can find many more on our website. Um, I also just want to mention the main Autobahn sale. It's just ending now, but that goes all season long. They've expanded it um, in recent years because of the demand. I just am overwhelmed with how much you know and so grateful that you're you're sharing all of this with Anna, with us, Anna. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Andrea from the Wild Seed Project who is on the line right now and is responsible for uh, for all of the, the links. Um, thank you so much, Andrea, for, for getting those to me so that we could share them promptly uh, with, with everybody on the call. The next big question is, and not just for me, will you come to my house? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of folks saying, does the Wild Seed Project do individual consultations? How can we get personalized advice? What do you think? Yeah, this is another tough one because as the demand grows uh, for native plants and the education about them grows, uh, people want to, to help in figuring out how to design and plan their gardens, what to do, how to learn the plants. And I'd say the first step to take is to take our pledge to rewild because that's really gonna get you started. Um, we have a very small staff and we have, uh, we're growing, but uh, our staff are very getting very, very busy, um, especially now. And so we don't have the capacity to, um, do private consultations with everyone. We're putting our time and energy into creating some really lovely demonstration projects with different partners like land trusts and um, some even for-profit organizations. So we're excited to be able to share ideas of what you can do in your yard. Um, but I think taking that pledge to rewild will give you some some really great resources and tools and guidance to get started. And I read through that. There's tons of great links. There's um, lots of articles and how-to resources, which I think is what people are really looking for. And then if you're especially looking for um, how to start learning about what how to identify all the plants that are actually already growing in your yard, there's some really great resources. I like Personally, I still love field guides, even though everyone's into the apps these days, but I love um, Newcomb's Wildflower Guide and Ted Elliman's Wildflowers of New England. But I do love using iNaturalist. It's a phone app um, that uses citizen science and geolocation to, you can uh, identify a plant and then it'll find uh, where that plant is and, and record data about that. And then, um, I also like Go Botany, which is uh, developed by Native Plant Trust. That's an online key um, that you can go through and kind of just through the process of elimination, figure out what your plant is, answer any questions that you do know, and you don't have to know very much, um, and then figure out your plant that way. Um, or picture this is, a, is one that I've started trying out recently. It's not always accurate, but I think it has, it's pretty good, but I'd double, I'd cross reference for sure, because um, that just uses a photo algorithm to identify the plants. Gotcha. That's, that's super helpful. And I appreciate Wild Seed Project's commitment to your mission. You're going to spread the word and we will, we'll do the work in our own yards. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or transforming our own yards. We do have a, a few specific questions though that I'll, I'll ask and get yeah. your advice while we can. You mentioned that, um, that the sedge and the wild strawberry might not really hold up to, to a lot of play. If you've got kids who are gonna be uh, doing soccer games in the backyard, what do you recommend for a, 
a native plant lawn replacement? Definitely. Um, well, before I answer that, I'll also mention one more thing that I forgot to mention earlier. Um, Wild Sea Project for our members, we do a monthly Q&A session. So that's another way to get your individual questions answered. Um, it's for members only, so it's good incentive to become member a member with us. It's an annual membership, and um, you get a whole hour with both Heather McCargo, our founder, and seed program manager, and myself. Um, so it's very valuable to have that. So to answer the question about sedge and wild strawberry and what to plant for maybe more of a turf alternative for you know recreation and things like that. I, at this point in time, there still needs to be more research on native lawn alternatives, but um, for, the, for that situation where you're, it's going to get a lot of use, I don't know if there is a really great alternative that can be mowed, you know, over and over and over and get lots of foot traffic. So I actually recommend if you're going to, you know, preserve a piece of your lawn intentionally that's going to be used in a specific way to, um, you can, you know, leave the lawn that's already there, or if you're starting fresh, you can use um, some lawn uh, plants that are, you know, less of a resource hog. So um, you could do a fescue mix, uh, which is a, a variety of different species of fescues. They're not all native. Um, and, you know, they're very drought tolerant. They're, they don't grow too big. Um, they, don't need to be mowed as frequently and um, they're just less resource hogs than the traditional lawn um, like Kentucky bluegrass. So um, I think eco lawn, if you search that, I can also put in some resources at the end, but um, look for a good fescue mix. Eco lawn is a, is a great search word and That's you'll funny. find something kind of an alternative for that situation. Does, does clover fall into that category too of a, of a lawn alternative? Yes, um, some people use micro clover, which is a small white clover um, because it grows low to the ground and it, it replicates a turf a little bit more than like red clover, which gets a little taller. Um, so yeah, that's a nice option. It's not native, but it does flower and clovers do attract a lot of pollinators. So. In your lawn, if you see weeds coming up that are not native, it's not something to be concerned about. Um, it's good to identify them and figure out what they are. But things like clovers and dandelions and, um, you know, violets and um, things like that are not necessarily, even if they're not native, they're not detrimental and they actually are often larval hosts or fix nitrogen in your soil or improve the soil in some way, or they, you know, host pollinators. So um, it, there are some invasive species to watch out for um, that like uh, um, the creeping bellflower, that's um, a really tough one, especially in the Portland area to get rid of. But um, for the most part, our lawns are not going to be filled with those kinds of plants. Okay, okay. Um would the, the things you recommended for a play space kind of turf, would those also be good choices for, for dogs, dog friendly landscaping? Yeah, I think so. I think just like it'll, those, that um, mix of, of fescues will act kind of like a regular lawn okay. um, in many ways. And I think dogs would be fine with it too. Great. A um, little bit of a different question. Many of us have sort of a, a combination septic field lawn right now. Is there anything we should be staying away from because the roots will go too deep or, or any other reason it might be in, you know, in, um, thank you. I'm just going to keep, I'm not just going to yeah. let you talk now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know exactly what you mean. And I get that question a lot too. Um, that is, uh, you basically can plant most things on top of a leach field. You just wanna make sure you're exactly, like you don't plant anything that's very deep rooted, like long, deep tap roots. So um, I would stick with, um, you could do a really nice low meadow mix or something like that. Um, something that can handle well-drained soils because leach fields are well-drained for a reason. So um, there's some really nice different types of, of meadows and that you could plant on top of that. Or 
um, have some shallower rooted shrubs like um, bush honeysuckle, things like that. Um, and if you want more ideas for different types of plants to plant for different situations, we have lots of plant lists on our website as well. So if you go to learn, the tab learn and, and the drop down and you'll get to what to plant, um, that will take you to a page with multiple plant lists, plants for pollinators, plants to plant after uh, invasive species removal, uh, and then our more comprehensive plant lists, which we're hoping to update soon, but it's still a really great resource. Um, we just want to make it easier to read in the future, but that one has, you know, plants for every different type of condition that you can think of. Perfect. I, like I said, I think you're going to see a, a bump in your web traffic <laughs> this afternoon. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the things we want to discourage from visiting our yards. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that brown tail moths don't like? And what is there any a thing that you mentioned today that while native and wonderful and attractive to pollinators is not a good choice for those of us who don't want to see another one of those brown tails in our <laughs> vicinity again? Yeah, that, that is a really tough one. I don't think it's necessarily what you plant that's going to affect that. So I think... Um, this is, is a part of a larger issue that we're facing in many regions. So in Maine, in many parts of Maine, the brown tail moth is the pest of concern. Whereas um, in, in Massachusetts, where I used to live, um, the gypsy moth, and I know the gypsy moth has been up here too, um, as well as the winter moth ha has been a real concern in very specific areas. Um, and those are both in, invasive moths as well. So we have native moths, which are great, which feed on foliage and they don't maybe defoliate trees completely because they're kept in check by their predators like birds and their important bird food. But a lot of the moths, um, you know, like gypsy moth and brown tail moth have these, you know, hairs on them that make them a little less pal palatable to a lot of birds, though I think there are probably some birds that eat them, but they're also they come in such large numbers that I don't know if the birds could possibly eat them all. <laughs> um, and so that comes with um, climate change is a big factor in that because uh, for many species of invasive pests that predate trees or diseases of trees as well, um, sometimes the way that they're kept in check is by um, really cold temperatures in the winter. And if we're having warmer winters, they're not you know, killing off those pests as readily or as frequently, or they're kept in check by like the gypsy moth um, has this fungal pathogen that attacks it if we have a wet spring and that helps drop the populations of gypsy moth. But when we have droughts, um, we see the cyclic, we see the numbers of gypsy moths go up. So um, the following year. So um, it's not really something that we can kind of solve with just our planting choices, unfortunately. That makes sense. Uh, disappointing that we can't just wave a wand and <laughs> make those brown tail moths go away. What about ticks? Are there, do you see a, a tick increase in native lawns or is there anything that we can do to be more, more cautious on that front? Yeah, that's another kind of one of those more systemic issues that's not um, just about our planting choices, but we, you know, you can do things if you're worried about ticks to kind of mitigate or um, keep your your risk of being in contact with ticks a little bit lower. So um, yes, when you plant more layers, that is more vegetation that's um, denser, that's closer maybe to your house or closer to where you'll be in contact with it. But, um, you know, I also like my father has had Lyme disease multiple times and he he actually doesn't really walk in the woods very much anymore, which is really unfortunate in my opinion, because we don't want to lose our contact with nature um, because of that. But um, he's gotten Lyme disease just by going out in his vegetable garden. And so, you know, you can get ticks by taking a walk in the woods, by walking around in a meadow or being on slightly closer proximity to vegetation. But that's the case kind of if you're somebody who's interested in being outside. So I'd say Take those precautions by, you know, wearing your socks over your pants, uh, white socks, white clothes, and um, checking yourself frequently. Um, 
and, you know, do what you would normally do. But if you're planting, you know, um, more higher vegetation in your backyard, say, and you have a meadow, um, you could mow a much wider path or keep like a three to four foot path. So you're not coming into contact with it all the time. It's not leaning over and hitting you. Um, that's something you can do. But I really don't think that that will increase your chances of coming into contact with ticks that significantly. I also think, you know, thinking about the habitat level, um, and uh, the different relationships of all the different species. Um, it had research has shown that um, you know the white-footed mouse and deer spread ticks around, and um, we actually have a lot of checks and balances that you know that keep rodent populations down, like predators, large predators. So if we can have larger tracts of um, conservation and larger tracts of habitat for those larger predators, uh, as well as, you know, things like coyotes and fisher cats and hawks, then we can keep, you know, the populations of, of rodents down and um, deer are a little bit trickier. That's another story. Um, and, but that will help kind of bring things a little bit more into balance. It doesn't mean we're going to get rid of ticks altogether, but yeah, it's another larger systemic issue that we can't solve or it's not going to be, you know, something that native plants will be responsible for. They're already out there. So it's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, it is. Anna, I wish we could keep you for the rest of the day because we have <laughs> dozens more questions. Thank you, everyone who, who shared your, your specific situations, everything you're interested in. As I said, the follow-up email that goes out later this afternoon will include links to the Wild Seed Project website where you can find all of those resources and that pledge to, uh, to rewild and, uh, and join Wild Seed. And you can spend an hour with Anna again next week or next month. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining today. We will be off next Friday ahead of Indigenous Peoples Day weekend. We hope that you'll use that found hour and reallocate it to Monday, October 11th, when the Wabanaki tribes will be holding a virtual Indigenous Peoples Day event. There'll be speakers and music and action, opportunities to take action together. And we'll share the registration link just as soon as we have that. The following week will be another change in our schedule because on Thursday, October 14th, we will have a very special dinner and learn. Uh, Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton, who represents the District of Columbia, uh, is gonna join us to talk about the importance of DC statehood. It's gonna be a fabulous evening and I hope to see you all there. Till then, have fun out there planting native plants. Anna, thanks a million, and uh, we'll see you all next time. <laughs>